Finally, we have a new MacBook Air, but who on earth is it for? The M1 MacBook Air, this is mine, which is now covered in stickers these days, redefined Apple's notebook line. Suddenly, you could grab Apple's cheapest, lightest, and quietest portable Mac and gain access to pro-level performance. However, all of that power and next-generation performance was housed in a rapidly aging body, which is this kind of wedge-shaped design. And as loved as this might be, the wedge-shaped design of the MacBook Air has been due an update for quite some time. Last week, and to my surprise, the update arrived in the form of the M2 MacBook Air. The wedge has been swapped for a mini MacBook Pro aesthetic, and the return of MagSafe is joined by a brand new Apple silicon chip, a notched screen, and a higher price tag. But with the M1 MacBook Air still very much alive and kicking on the Apple Store, who is the M2 MacBook Air for exactly? So the base level M2 MacBook Air is remarkably similar to that of its predecessor. The eight core CPU comes with eight gigabytes of unified memory and 256 gigabytes of SSD storage. However, while the base spec M1 MacBook Air comes with a seven core GPU, the base spec M2 MacBook Air comes with an eight core GPU. You also get a slightly larger 13.6 inch display, which now carries the liquid retina moniker, an improved 1080p FaceTime camera, apparently, and the return of MagSafe, as I mentioned earlier. That configuration will set you back $1,199 in the US or £1,249 in the UK for some unfathomable reason. The second spec offered immediately by Apple on their website retains the 8GB of unified memory but takes the GPU cores up to 10 and increases the SSD storage to 512GB. That lot will set you back an additional $300 or £300 on top of the base price. If you fancy some more memory, you'll pay $200 or £200 for 16GB or $400 or £400 for 24 four gigabytes, which is a new option for the M2 MacBook Air. And that additional unified memory option will offer some comfort to those who felt shortchanged by the M1 version's maxed out 16 gigabytes. When it comes to adding additional storage to your M2 MacBook Air, it's as expensive as we've come to expect from Apple. Just like its M1-based sibling, the M2 MacBook Air can be configured with up to two terabytes of SSD storage, but that will add $800 or 800 pounds to the price tag. It doesn't stop there though. This time around, we get some rather interesting power adapter options as well. If you want, you can choose to stick with the standard 30 watt brick or upgrade to either a dual USB-C 35 watt charger or a 67 watt fast charger. And that fast charger will allow you to charge your M2 MacBook Air to 50% in just 30 minutes. Now, if you tick every single box during the configuration process for the M2 MacBook Air, the most you can pay is a rather troubling $2,499 or £2,549. So this is an undeniably powerful yet increasingly expensive MacBook. The purchasing decision, therefore, deserves far more thought than this laptop. I'm so glad Apple decided to keep the M1 MacBook Air in the lineup. They should have dropped the price, I think, but given the fact that this laptop offers so much bang for buck, it can just about be excused. As I noted last week, I think the continued presence of the M1 MacBook Air is a real thorn in the side of its shiny new big brother. I cannot emphasize this enough, and I'm sorry, you will hear this from me quite a bit over the next few weeks and months. The M1 MacBook Air remains the perfect laptop, I think, for 95% of people who want a MacBook Air. We're living in challenging economic times. For instance, in the UK, we're battling through a cost of living crisis thanks to the soaring energy costs, astronomical prices at the petrol pumps, and the continued economic fallout from the pandemic. So that £250 price difference between the base spec M1 MacBook Air and the M2 MacBook Air is a lot of money when most of us are still trying to figure out how to keep our personal finances in check. The same goes for businesses. If I needed to buy a team, a bunch of MacBooks, I wouldn't think twice about getting them the M1 MacBook Air. To be honest, the M2 version wouldn't even come into consideration. So if you're trying to figure out which one to buy out of these two laptops and you're watching your pennies at the moment, stop watching this video now and just go and buy yourself an M1 MacBook Air. You will not be disappointed. Still watching? Thought so. After all, how could I so brazenly swipe aside that brand new M2 MacBook Air? The reason is simple, and it comes down to everyday use. Trust me, if you took the M1 MacBook Air and placed it directly next to an M2 MacBook Air and did your kind of normal everyday stuff like email, web browsing, YouTube viewing, 
spreadsheet stuff, whatever it might be, they would both feel identical. They'd boot up just as quickly as one another. Mac OS would feel equally snappy on both of those laptops. And all of your apps would open with barely any hesitation, regardless of which machine you're using. Now, I occasionally receive comments from people who bemoan the 16 gigabyte unified memory limit on the M1 MacBook Air. But I receive far more comments from people who have bought the base spec like this one and absolutely love it. This confirms my suspicions. I think the MacBook Air power users really are in a minority. Now the M2 is an impressive chip, there's no doubting that. The percentage increases over the M1 chip tell their own story. You get 50% more memory bandwidth, 18% greater CPU performance, and up to 35% more graphics performance. But we should revisit the unified memory situation again. As noted earlier, if 16 gigabytes wasn't enough for you on the M1 MacBook Air, the presence of that 24 gigabyte option will be very good news indeed. You can get more in a MacBook Pro, obviously, but if you do any kind of memory intensive computing, the M2 MacBook Air should provide the headroom you need during those sustained intensive workloads. However, I'd argue that the biggest opportunity for pushing the M2 MacBook Air to its limits lies within that GPU. The increase to 10 cores of graphical power is joined by a next generation media engine, which is capable of playing back multiple streams of 8K video. Just think about that for a moment. A MacBook Air without a fan that can handle multiple streams of 8K H.264 footage, it's just utterly bonkers. Despite this, I highly doubt that anyone working with 8K footage would make the M2 MacBook Air their default production machine. But I think that's missing the point. The fact that it is capable of such feats makes the M2 MacBook Air an incredible backup for a very specific audience. A case in point, last year I had to travel to Montreal on business and I landed on the day that Apple announced the new MacBook Pro lineup. That meant I had to shoot, edit and publish a reaction video that evening from my hotel room. Now the only laptop I had to hand was my base spec M1 MacBook Air this one here, and it got me through. In fact, it barely murmured as I edited 10-bit 422 4K footage. It did stutter occasionally and understandably, but imagine how much more headroom I'd have had if I'd had the M2 version in my backpack. Now that won't be the default role of an M2 MacBook Air for most people, but if your main production machine is, let's say, a Mac Studio, you could do a lot worse than grab yourself an M2 MacBook Air as a backup for when you're out and about like I was last year and you need to get something done. Just having all of that computing and graphical power in such a small, thin and light MacBook, which is admittedly cheaper than a MacBook Pro, would be a massive benefit to people like me in those situations. So who on earth is the M2 MacBook Air for? Well, I think it comes down to three types of users. The first one is those who have the budget for it and want the latest and greatest, that's fine. The second is those who have a specific performance gripe with the M1 MacBook Air. So if there's something in this laptop that you don't like and that's put you off buying it, but the M2 version addresses that, then it makes sense to get one. And the third is video editors who need an occasional portable production machine, but who don't want to splash out on a MacBook Pro. As you guess, I am going to dig into the M1 versus M2 comparison quite a bit more over the next few weeks. So if you don't want to miss those videos, make sure you subscribe and hit that bell. But if you do fit into one of those three categories that I've just mentioned, I'm confident that you will be blown away by your brand new M2 MacBook Air whenever it arrives. If you don't fit into any of those categories and you are watching the pennies at the moment, just get yourself an M1 MacBook Air. If you want to find out what I thought about all of the announcements last week, keep watching for a link to my WWDC reaction video.